Hello and welcome in to the 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast. I'm National Recruiting Analyst Cooper Patagna alongside 24-7 Sports Director of Scouting Andrew Ivins. We've got a loaded show for you today. The boys were in the ATL this weekend as the Under Armour Combine took place and a lot of names emerging as guys working their way up the board in the top 247. We've got an update coming at the end of the month in 2025. We also will get to talk a little bit about EA Sports, the new NCAA football game coming out in May. And Drew and I, we're going to take our pick. If you had a 99 overall player rating, who would it be? I can imagine there's probably only going to be a couple of those guys. So we'll give our best guesses there. But Drew, one little thing. How about this? You've been talking about this guy for quite some time, two years into his tenure in Tampa Bay, and that is Alex Golesh in USF. Brad Crawford at 24-7 Sports. He put out his 10 daring predictions for college football season in 2024. How about this one? USF to the college football playoff. Now remember, we're expanding from four teams to 12 teams in 2024. We also have five auto bids, and that's going to be four of the Power Five conferences and one group of five team as well. So Brad Crawford making the case for USF and Drew. They return a lot. They're coming off a seven and six season. You get the quarterback back, your leading receiver as well. Non-conference games. You got Alabama and you got Miami in the first four weeks of the season. What do you think? I know you're a big big fan of these guys. (laughs) I didn't realize they had Miami on the schedule. I knew Alabama. I had that one circled for week two. All right, Kalen DeBoer showing up in Tuscaloosa, but a ton of roster turnover. Cooper, me and you have talked about that secondary. You look at USF, what do they want to do? They want to throw the ball. Alex Gilles comes from that Josh Heupel tree. By, uh, by, Byron Brown, the quarterback, that's a guy that the uh, collective there in Tampa had to pony up for, and they're hoping to hold on to him. I was around some of USF staff a few weeks ago at a coaching clinic. They're fired up about him. Also get back. They're two leading wide receivers for me. Uh, But Cooper, if this is going to happen, they got to improve on the defensive side of the ball. USF 33rd in scoring offense last year, 112th in scoring defense. So they can put up points. um, But if they're going to make a run and maybe upset some of those teams, then they're going to have to figure it out. And I know they brought in some transfers, not a ton, but I think five guys in the secondary. So certainly interesting. And look, even if USF doesn't make a college football playoff bid, I think Alex Goles is going to be a hot name uh, next coaching cycle. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm, 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 I'm looking at USF, another interesting nugget that Brad had in his article. USF was the only group of five program with a top 50 ranked recruiting class this past year in 2024. Drew, you have the pulse in the state of Florida a little bit and, and, if this were to come to fruition, even if it didn't, right, let's talk about a double-digit win team, hypothetically, for USF. Alex Galesh, you mentioned, going to be a hot name. What happens if Billy Napier doesn't make it out of 2024 in Gainesville? What do you think about that potential marriage, Alex Galesh, to the Florida Gators? <laughs> well, it's an interesting one. I, I think if Florida were to open up, and could, we've had this conversation kind of always go opposite of what you did. And Billy Napier had a ton of success there at Louisiana, a guy that came from the SEC. He had, he had experience as a position coach. Galesh would feel a little bit like the same. So that, I haven't ran the calculations on that one in my head for Florida. Uh, but I think he's a, he's a guy that's, you know, if Tennessee continues to win, right, he, he puts together another strong season. I, I can see him certainly getting linked to some of those top-end power four Remember, not power five job openings. Drew, I'm going to put you in the hot seat here. If you did have a pick today for who is going to be the group of five representative in the 2024 CFP, who would it be? I don't, I don't know if I'm buying in, in USF. I, I think you got to look somewhere in the American potentially. Uh, but there's been a lot of a lot of turnover, some coaches and moving pieces. So I don't have a name. Do you have one? Is, I'm, I have a hunch you're going to go with Tulane. Yeah, I think the three that kind of stand out are Liberty, USF and Tulane. I like Tulane a lot. I, I mean, Ty Thompson coming over from Oregon, I think that guy uh, has a lot of ability. Mario Williams coming over from USC, the one-time transfer from Oklahoma. I think they're a really talented team. I think Willie Fritz put that roster in pretty good shape, even with the departures that they've had to the NFL and Michael Pratt moving on as well. 
I think Tulane's a ready-made spot to make a jump. I'm pretty fascinated in that storyline, what's going to play out there. USF certainly looking to make a charge here in 2024. Guys, we appreciate you joining us as always. You can find the Oyster Boys every Tuesday and Wednesday on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel at 5 o'clock Eastern time. And if you're in the chat right now, I'll be in there. Make sure to like and subscribe. We appreciate you guys supporting the podcast. All right, Drew, we were in the Peach State over the weekend at the Under Armour Atlanta Combine, one of the most loaded ones I think we went to in 2023. You and I kind of had the conversation last year about, hey, what what are we uh, trying to get out of this Combine? And I think very basically, if you break it down uh, at its foundation – Shout out to Murph in the background. I hear him over there. Uh, if you break it down, it's, its foundation is these. this is a combine and an exposure point to where we want to see these guys live, body type, see, all right, what is the growth projection kind of look like over the next year or so? And I remember three guys that ended up in the top 10. How about this? Cam Coleman, Ryan Williams, and Jordan Ross, right? And a lot of these guys, we were still getting information on. Cam Coleman goes from... 180 all the way into the into the uh, top 32 and then Jordan Ross also works his way up to the board from 81 to number 12 so Drew big weekend and let's start with the alpha dog how about Malik Autry right the Auburn commit and the guy that we really like inside our top 100 right now in the top 247 in 2025 and I'll tell you what uh, it says 6'5 290 I think he showed up 6'5 and a half 320 pounds dancing bear nimble great foot body quickness Drew, what'd you like about him and his performance? He stole my note. I had written down there, Dancing Bear. I guess my dog Murph is a big fan of, of Malik Autry. How about him just going crazy as you're trying to intro this? Uh, Coop, you know, seeing him in testing, I, I think he only took a few one-on-one reps, but that's all we really needed to see. And you turn on the tape of this guy, I mean, he could be a two-gapper. He can be a one-gapper there in the middle, really productive as a junior in the state of Alabama. I just thought the way he was built, the, the growth potential, and then you said it. I mean, listed at 290, came in closer to 330, uh, had a really good short shuttle time, and I thought it's just how he changed directions. I think he is a potential war daddy in the middle in one of these big two conferences. Yeah, committed to Auburn right now. I know a bunch of schools are involved. You could see him making an impact in the Big Ten as well. So I thought he – and what's important with these events, right – you see the tape, and you want that to line up with your eyes at these uh, at these off-season events. And yes, it's not padded, uh, but you can still body type. You can identify. You can figure out who is the the alpha. And it was an easy decision for us to go with Malik Autry. Yeah, you can start to put the puzzle pieces together a little bit. I think the biggest thing, and the and the reason I like to refer back to a guy like Jordan Ross. Jordan Ross only had two and a half sacks at Vestavia Hills as a junior. And here you look at this guy, multi-sport athlete, background in basketball. As a senior, he upset by 10-plus sacks. I think he had 12-and-a-half on the season. So you can start to see the trend of where these guys are really heading. Malik Autry only had three-and-a-half sacks. Now, he's not an edge rusher. He's playing on the interior, but you still expect a little bit more. We had the same thing with LJ McCray. So we feel really good about Malik Autry, where he's heading. Drew, you mentioned he's committed to Auburn, but he's going to take visits to US, uh, UCF, excuse me, Ole Miss in Florida in March. You also got Miami hanging around there as well. There's just not a lot of guys that you see with his type of size that can move the way that he does. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a former NFL standout, Akeem Hicks. That's kind of the name that kind of came up a little bit. So Malik Autry, if you're an Auburn fan, that's going to be one. Uh, They're going to be white-knuckling it over the next couple months to make sure that they get him across the finish line. The next five on offense, and let me break down this graphic for you because the guy at the top, Laganza Hayward, number two there, you see listed as a safety. He is a three-phase player out of the state of Georgia, worked exclusively at receiver at this camp. We have him listed as a safety. I think we still feel pretty good about that projection. We'll talk about him in a minute. Other guys, Julian Lewis, the reclass, the number four quarterback in the country in 2024. Alex Payne, a guy that we really like out of the state of Georgia, committed to North Carolina. And then you see a Kylan Deer, Jonah Winston, the brother of former Heisman Trophy winner, Jameis Winston. So, Drew... I tell you what, uh, no shortage of star power here. And let's start at the top, but your impressions of Julian Lewis committed to USC, taking a lot of visits. Um, This is a, I wouldn't say difficult, but I think if there's one position group where you have to be a little bit measured in terms of your takeaways, it would be the quarterbacks. That being said, I thought Julian Lewis was kind of par for the course of what we've seen from him. 
Yeah, and I thought he got better as the throwing session went on. These Under Armour camps are, are really difficult, I think, to evaluate the quarterbacks. They kind of throw at stationary targets, and then you get some one-on-ones, but it's not like an Elite 11 type of workout. And this was Julian Lewis's home turf uh, there at Carrollton High School. They got an excellent IPF. I mean, the weight room is as big as some of the colleges you visit uh deep ball was the best of the bunch i mean he's just got a smooth stroke cooper and i think the big if knock on julian lewis is going to be the size i mean he is six foot uh 180 pounds he is not the biggest individual with that being said in terms of his ability to throw receivers open make the high level throws i mean it was clear cut he was the guy there on sunday interested and excited to see how this quarterback process plays out. Remember when Julian reclassified, he was our number one prospect in 2026, comes in now as QB4 uh, in 2025. And if you look at the three individuals ahead of him, Bryce Underwood, George McIntyre, and Tavian St. Clair, all those guys are kind of prototypical frames multi-sport athletes. And then you got Julian Lewis, who is a quarterback. And he's kind of a quarterback protege in in terms of a guy that has certainly been coached up um, and and knows the position, can see that full field. So we thought he was advanced for a 2026. And really, since he's reclassified here in in 2025, I, I think he's one of the top you know, facilitators, distributors, point guards, uh, when it comes to these quarterbacks, again, just the knock is going to be that size. And, and I think, Drew, what you're alluding to here over the last two years, I don't think there's been much of a weight fluctuation with Julian Lewis. You look at him, six foot and a half, I think he's hovering around 180 pounds. That's the biggest thing, right, is how high is the ceiling for Julian Lewis? And I think the other thing about his game that I really like, he plays within himself. He, he is a cerebral assassin. His biggest asset is his experience. And you mentioned the reclass. If there was a guy that could do it, I think it would be Julian Lewis. Over the last two years, 48 touchdowns in each of his, I would say, sophomore freshman season. Uh, and then he went from 12 INTs to two INTs. So he has cleaned it up, right? And then in terms of the production as well, a lot of yardage through for over 3,000 yards this year, playing at one of the most difficult levels of high school football there in the state of Georgia. So we'll talk some more quarterbacks a little bit later in the show. But Drew, a guy that I think I was really introduced to the first time, Laganza Hayward. And I was pretty excited about this guy. You see right here listed as a safety. I mentioned that uh, earlier in the segment. Drew, he worked out a receiver, and whether it was receiver, whether it was safety, diving in in the tape this morning, I mean, this guy is a playmaker uh, and, quite honestly, maybe one of the most uh, impressive prospects that I think we saw in person. Uh, and you think about what he can do. I mentioned the three-phase ability. You can move him around on the back end. He can play on the perimeter on offense, also out of the slot as well. I don't know what he is, and I think that's okay, but he is something in my mind, and I think he proved that on Sunday. I love this kid. All right. We put him into the top 247 back in November, and he had visited like Charlotte the week before. I don't think he had many power four looks at all. Uh, He just did a story with Steve Wiltfong of 247 Sports. He said his top three schools are uh, Alabama, Florida State, and Tennessee. So the recruitment has quickly corrected. Coop, I think he's a back seven defender. You turn on the tape, he's quick to trigger. He smashes people. Uh, I thought the size checked out in person, came in just over six foot one, under 200 pounds, right in that 195 range. He had about 0% body fat. He had an eight pack. His shirt was all rolled up. I was surprised he worked out at wide receiver, uh, but he makes plays on that side of the ball. So uh, big fan, had the longest broad jump of the day. And I'm just going to say this, it's one of the longest broad jumps I've ever seen on the UA circuit. So he's explosive, might not have a true top end gear, but I think with where the game is right now, you want to get athletes in the secondary guys that can not only defend the pass, but also defend the run. I think Laganzo Hayward is a guy you need to know. Um, and I think only more and more schools are going to get involved. Safety number 12 for us right now. I think he's sitting at like 143 in the rankings. I think he's more of a day two player based on what I saw in Atlanta. It's got to make you feel pretty good, huh, Drew? When they're Charlotte, or who was the other team with Laganza Hayward at the time? I think when we put him in the top 247. They were like Marshall or Liberty or something. I mean, <laughs> right. There you go. Always know what they're doing. You know, people don't think think we do, but I guess we can spot them uh, hey. at some time. Right? Hey, big, big win. A little golf clap for you. Pat yourself on the back there. All right, Drew, we got three names left here on offense. Kylan Deer, running back out of Mississippi that we really like a lot. But 
the name that I really want to focus on and a guy that you kept bringing up to me uh, while we were on the sidelines watching. Tell me a little bit about Alex Payne, committed to North Carolina out of the state of Georgia. You really like this kid, and I think he kind of showed out on Sunday and proved why. Yeah, 6'4", 265 pounds. He lacks the play strength, but I think technically he is buttoned up. I mean, the hands are where they need to be. He can recover, you know, committed to North Carolina. I was talking with someone in Chapel Hill um, as I was sitting in that Delta lounge waiting to catch my flight. I said, Alex Payne, you guys got a good one. They said they didn't even expect him to commit. They thought they were in it. He showed up on campus uh, and he was ready to go. And UNC was fired up about that, you know. Listed as a tackle, has played left tackle. I think he might be more of an interior guy, but you get into those arm measurements and the length. I mean, he has uh, the reach to protect the corner. You know, one of the longest arm measurements of the day, big wingspan at 82 inches. Uh, Coop, I think this guy has a ton of developmental upside, only scratching the surface of, the, of his potential. What I really loved about him, first in line on Sunday. You know, he was kind of the, the leader, you know, wanted to be there, wanted to be coached up, encouraging people. You know, people can roll their eyes about that. But certainly, you know, when you have a bunch of power five offensive linemen in the same setting, you want to see these guys separate themselves. I just love the between the ears, the football IQ on Alex Payne. I think Mac Brown and the Tar Heels are getting a steal right now. And I'll add Mike Bobo, the Georgia offensive coordinator. He was also there on Sunday. His son was working out. So NCAA rules allow him to be there I saw Bobo whip out at the phone and get some footage of those one-on-one -on -one reps I guess he didn't have that camcorder that Georgia coaches use I wonder if that goes into Kirby Smart's like interview strategy of like all right who's got a son in high school that is a good enough player in terms of a collegiate prospect that you know we could utilize because what it was Bobo this year right last year I think it was Muschamp right with Whit Muschamp Brand Brown's been there before. and then Brian McClendon was there wasn't he yeah Right. Yeah. So, I mean, Georgia. And I'll tell you what, like we laugh about that. That that's an advantage to see these guys get multiple exposure points. This was the most loaded camp that we went to in 2023. It certainly wasn't far off from that point. Drew, the other thing that you brought up that I kind of want to read to you on this that I thought was fascinating. You know, we talk a lot about, yeah, like the, the, the benefit of being able to eyeball these guys and seeing how they're going to grow and what that's going to look like and, and kind of what the trajectory is going to be over the next one to two years. You brought up the psychological aspect of a guy like Alex Payne that you really like, comes from a military family. You can kind of see the way that he handled himself. You talked about first in line. I'm not going to name names, but on the other side of that, there were certainly some players that you leave the event and you start scratching your head a little bit about hey, we had this guy slotted here. The industry has this player slotted here. I didn't see it. And, I, and I'm not talking about like, yeah, you can see the physical makeup, but in terms of the engagement of guys really, really wanting to be there, every little thing is something, right? And the whole puzzle piece of trying to figure these guys out. This camp, more than any other ones in, in, in quite some time, was the one camp where I kind of took, uh, you know, you, you do your homework and, and – you, you take that into consideration a little bit, but you walk away from it. I was pretty disappointed in a handful of players uh, in terms of, I would say, their just lack of involvement and engagement overall. Right, Coop. And it's, it's one exposure point in the entire process, right? The film is still king. We got the, the, the senior seasons. I mean, it is just one, you know, two, three hour session, but you can learn a lot. And I think it is extremely valuable now in the era we're at with NIL, with the transfer portal and player movement, I, I continue to hear it. I know you hear the same from uh, guys on the other side in personnel departments. You want kids that want to be in the building for the right reasons. You want to avoid the guys that think they have made it as high school juniors because guess what? They're going to show up on campus as freshmen and they're going to have that same mindset. And it doesn't work like that at most of the places. You're going to come in and they're going to break you down and they're going to make you earn everything you're given. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, when you see a guy and he doesn't take any reps, you know, you kind of leave and you mark that down in, in a, a system like we got like next gen. All right. This guy didn't want to be there. Um, and maybe he's the biggest individual. Why was he not taking reps? So it's certainly something that you you kind of file away for another day. And like you said, you know, this is a, a puzzle. We're just trying to put the pieces together. We're going to talk about um, 
a kid on the opposite end of the spectrum a little bit later, Tyler Atkinson. I mean, you talk about a dog. I think he was the only player to work out with multiple position groups. We'll talk about that guy later. But that's some it, it catches your eye, right? And the same thing, negative, positive, how these guys kind of handle themselves throughout the event. All right, Drew, the last two guys, are Kylan Deer, uh, who I think is emerging as one of the top backs in the country out of the state of Mississippi, 200 pounds plus, hovering around six feet. I mean, north-south, revisited the tape this morning. He plays so fast and under control. That is stuff that you cannot teach at the position. I love the vision, love the patience, the balance, the body control as well. I mean, he is just built to really kind of play in the SEC. I'm excited about him, his recruitment as well. And Drew, the last one here, how about Jonah Winston, right? All 151 pounds of him at five foot nine, playing multiple positions, 2026 out of Hoover, Alabama, the brother of Jameis Winston. Talked about that earlier in the show. Drew, there's something there. Uh, I think Jonah Winston, you revisit the times and the testing data, maybe leave you uh, wanting more. But in terms of what really mattered, getting in a one-on-one setting, kind of seeing the competitive temperament, the route tree as well. Two years to grow, we're not pressing the panic button at all yet, but there is definitely something there with these two guys in terms of football players. Yeah, I'll get into Jonah first, and then we can come back to my guy, AK. Um Someone we threw into the top 100 for for 2026. I didn't even know who he was on Sunday, right? So you got the one on ones going on, and his number. What was he wearing? Nine or three? I kept writing it down, and then it's like, oh wait, that's Jameis Winston's brother. So you know, for a slot receiver, also plays baseball like his brother did. I, I would agree, and he does a little bit of everything at Hoover. You know, they play him a quarterback, slot, running back. Uh, he makes plays. So feel good about him early on in this stage. And, you know, a guy that went 4-6 as a 14- or 15-year-old, plenty of time to get faster. Uh, with Alvin Deer, the running back, Cooper, I think he's RB9 for us. I was going through our rankings this morning, and I, I'll admit, you know, I haven't done a deep dive on, on the running back class. That hasn't been a position group that has been assigned to me. But I think you can make a case that he is – RB4, RB5, over 2,000 yards this past season, 20 touchdowns, also threw three touchdown passes. I mean, he's kind of what you want them to look like in this era where it's a by-committee type of approach. I would agree, very north-south. I think he's got a slashing run style. Uh, But you turn on the highlights, the first 10 clips are all touchdown runs of uh, 40-plus yards. I mean, he just gets that second level and takes off. I think he was a 4-5 on the lasers, a lot to like about Deer. And it seems like Ole Miss, Mississippi State are in there. I know Mario Cristobal landed the helicopter at his school. Uh, that recruitment is only getting cranked up. I should have mentioned it earlier in the show, but uh, the list that we were working off of, the Alpha Dog, the top five on offense, defense, shout out to our boy Hudson Standish, works with us. Our scouting group does a phenomenal job. And there you have it, the top five, AK Deer, a name certainly to keep an eye on. Mario Cristobal getting a lot of use in that helicopter. All right, Drew. On the defensive side of the ball, how about Justice Terry from Manchester, Georgia? This guy, top 20 player in the country, committed to the Georgia Bulldogs. The last verified height weight we had on him, 6'5", 275 pounds. Drew, he came in at 6'5", 263. I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, But a lot of these guys, uh, you see the weight fluctuation. I think a lot of these guys involved in winter sports playing basketball as well. I, I knew that was the case with Jordan Ross. But Drew... Flashes of dominance, uh, I think you see from from Justice Terry and a guy that's still trying to figure it out. He's going to play for the Bulldogs, but right now he's just a puppy, right? I've said that before. He'll get in that strength conditioning program. It's going to take him a year or two as well to add a little bit of polish. But in terms of what this guy can be, I mean, I love where we have him right now because I think that's kind of the that's that's the fit. He, he's in the top twenty, but I would not be surprised if this guy just starts to incrementally work his way up the board. The more of a feel that he gets for the on-field presence as well. Coop, I, I feel like he's one of these IDLs for Georgia that can really be a difference maker. And, and Georgia hasn't had issues recruiting the defensive line, but I think you know they're still searching for that guy that can take the next step and, and wreck havoc on Saturdays and, and and just make things extremely difficult on a snap to snap basis. And, you know, we'll see if that's Jordan Hall here in, in 2024, a former five star for us. But Justice Terry, I, I would agree. I think the ceiling is pretty high. We saw him at the Future 50 this past summer. Uh, and the thing that stands out to me about that Future 50 workout, Cooper, I don't remember 
Uh, I don't know if you remember it. They did the, what was it, the the L drill. It was a race between the bigs, O-line, D-line. I think he went like 7-1-7 in that L drill, which is super important for these uh, these pass rushers in terms of the ability to change directions. I would agree. You put on the tape kind of once you leave in, leave in more, but you know he has, he has it in him. Uh, it's just going to take someone to unlock it. So I thought it was a great performance. And he was a guy that wanted – to get the reps, you know, he was in there getting in the face of, of, of the offensive lineman. Love to see it from Justice Terry. 35 inch plus arms as well. That showed up in the one-on-one. I, I think a lot of offensive linemen had a lot of difficulty just dealing with his raw ability, even though he's still trying to get things together from a technique standpoint. Obviously you see the flashes of what he can be. Drew, another guy that has no shortage of physical clay. How about Daryl Johnson? Goes by Duke Johnson, the number 33 ranked player per 24 seven sports. Drew, we love this kid. Uh, sim- similar to Laganza Hayward, another three phase guy. I think, you know, you talk to teams around the country that really like the player. I think they're, they're struggling to figure out, okay, what box does he fit in, right? Is he going to be a strong safety? Is he going to be overhang roles? Is he going to be a weak side linebacker? Can he uh, pass rush off the edge situationally? The biggest takeaway that I had from seeing him in person is some guys, you just give that label, take them and figure it out, right? We want the player and the physical clay is there. I mean, he's, he's six foot plus, he's over 200 pounds. He's also a guy with almost a, a six foot eight wingspan. He's got the multi-sport background. I think he's hovering around low four sixes, Drew. But the biggest thing that stood out with him is he needs reps. I, I, I don't think this is a guy that has yet to develop the spatial awareness and instincts when it comes to playing uh, in pass coverage, but in terms of just seeing him on the field and his kind of read and react ability, it's all there. You can't teach the straight line speed, the explosiveness, also the athleticism in space. That showed up a couple times where he got put in the trail position, made some plays down the field in pass coverage. He is something. I don't know what he is. I think he's probably going to end up playing uh, as an off-ball backer, and he can do a lot of different things, Drew, but I like this kid. We got him at 33. I don't think we're too far off. It was kind of a calculated shot, but I I like this guy a lot. Yeah, you've been championing uh, Duke Johnson behind the scenes really since, I think, November. Coop, what stands out to me, and I didn't see much of the one-on-ones for the linebackers and running backs. I was outside chasing people down, trying to get headshots and, and whatnot. But physically, he looked apart from the frame. And then you put on the tape, and usually some of these guys where they're like these back seven i'm going to use the word you hate hybrids like you don't know what they are they're kind of chess pieces you know they're sometimes they're like timid to make tackles and that is not duke johnson i mean he is physical at the point of attack so i I love that and and then just the fact that he has been a chess piece on on defense he's been a wide corner an edge rusher and then kind of like a weak side linebacker and i think you could do the same thing on saturdays with him flip him over to the other side of the ball he's playing like running back wide receiver. I think he gets some snaps at Wildcat quarterback. Uh, And then the basketball tape. I mean, he was all region defensive player of the year as a sophomore. Uh, Again, I agree everything you said. I do not know what he is, but you take it and you figure it out later. Sometimes it's not a benefit uh, to be the best athlete on the field. And what I mean by that is when you're such a freak of nature and you have the position versatility, especially when you're playing lower level competition like Duke Johnson is, you can play anywhere on the field. Uh, and although that's to the advantage of your current program and, and, uh, and how that benefits your team, in terms of your long-term development, sometimes that can limit you a little bit. Now, guys like Terry Bussey, I think we've seen kind of break through that mold. I think Duke Johnson is going to be one of those guys. Ultimately, at the end of the day, will probably be a second-level defender. He's going to take a little bit of time. That's going to be okay. I think long-term ceiling-wise, there's still a lot to like about Duke Johnson. Interested to see what happens with his recruitment. Florida State has been mentioned as a team to beat. Georgia has yet to pull the trigger. That's kind of uh, one to watch, see what happens there out of the state of Georgia. All right, Drew, going down the list, Dalen Pinson, uh, sound the alarms, unranked 2025. That will not be the case for long. Uh, Out of Sandy Creek, Georgia, Drew, here's what he did on Sunday. He measured in 5'10", 160. He then proceeded to run a 4.48. He had a 37-inch vert. He had a 4.13 shuttle, and he had a 10.8 broad. Okay, so if you turned that type of performance in to the NFL Combine, which takes place next week in Indianapolis, 
he'd be in pretty good company. Uh, you turn on the tape, Drew, this is not just a guy that showed up, had a really strong testing day. There's a lot to like about the tape as well. I, I get the feeling, um, and I don't want to speak for you, but Dalen Pinson is a guy that can climb our board very, very quickly. I tell you what, man, just in terms of height, weight, speed, uh, position versatility, ball skills, box checker, box checker, box checker. So I love at the UA camps and and really any of these combines, I love watching the DBs, right? They, you know, put them through uh, the change of direction drills, the the footwork drills. And I think you can learn a lot. And this group in Atlanta compared to what we saw in Orlando, I thought it was significantly better. You know, me and you were talking about it. They split those guys up into two groups. One of those groups, I'm like, there isn't a guy out here I don't like. It was a tall group. It was a fast group. And, and Penson is someone that coming into the camp, you know, I was going through all these guys on the notes. I'm like, all right, SEC schools are looking at him. We don't have a grade on him. And saw him, you know, m- change directions a few times. I'm like, I, I'm all in. Get into the tape. And someone that has played quarterback on, on Friday nights, he's played wide receiver. I think his projection as a corner. Cooper, he reminds me of this kid, Ty Adams, who North Carolina signed out of the state of Georgia two years ago didn't get on the fields of freshman but you talk with anyone at unc they're fired up about this kid same thing two-way player productive as a quarterback uh and then big time speed markers and and dalen penson was the georgia 3a state champ in the triple jump uh he also finished second in the 110 hurdles both of those are extremely technical track and field events it's not like you're just sprinting or throwing something uh, you, a lot going on with the triple jump and a lot going on with the 110 hurdles. And to me, that signals, OK, this guy can figure out how to do some things uh, that require thinking. So Dalen Penson, absolutely, I agree. Kentucky is one of those teams that is pushing. Would not be surprised as as the data from Sunday makes the rounds if we see some more you know, uh, of the SEC and the, even the Big Ten get involved with Dalen Penson. Safe to say he'll get the Oyster Boys Derek Meadows treatment? <laughs> I mean, we, we got to go through the DB rankings, but yes, yes. I, I, I No, I get what you're saying. Yes, he, he's a stock up. <laughs> and if, it, if, if you know, you know, but if you don't, uh, Derek Meadows, a guy that was six foot six, freak of nature out of Bishop Gorman, was missing some production, but obviously has made the rounds uh, already early this spring and uh, is starting to gain a lot of recognition for it. So expect that with Dalen Pinson as well. Drew, how about this? A couple linebackers from the same school, Grayson High School in Georgia, Tyler Atkinson, Anthony Davis as well. Tyler Atkinson, uh, a guy in 2026 we're quite familiar with. Anthony Davis, not really, unranked. But, Drew, both of those guys had really good days. We talked about Tyler Atkinson a little bit earlier in the show. And this was a guy, Drew, that you were really high on. I hadn't seen in person. You loved the tape. And then you watched the tape, and it was a little bit of everything of what you got on Sunday. What I mean by that, I mentioned that Tyler Atkinson was the one player at this event that worked out with both the point of attack and defensive line edge group. He also worked worked out with the off-ball linebackers as well. And Drew, he held up in both categories, right? I mean, he's hovering around 200 pounds, quick twitch, explosive, got a lot of bend. He is a foam at the mouth type of competitor. You see him out there, super handsy guy, likes to get physical with you, super willing at the point of attack. Drew, I don't think he's going to be an off-ball guy. He's kind of a little bit of that word that you said I don't like to use. I think he's a tweener, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just think that's kind of where where he fits right now physically. He's still got two years to grow, so we'll see what happens. But he was a fun one, man. He was just flying around all over the place. And then you turn on the tape – and it's a direct correlation of kind of what we saw in person. Yeah, he is twitched up. And I was fired up that he worked out at, at Edge. I mean, this is a kid I've been tracking since I was first introduced to him when he was playing in the Under Armour eighth grade game. Then I saw him at the FBU freshman game, uh, saw him play this past season for Grayson. I, I think he's more pass rusher than he is off ball linebacker, but I think. He has a chance to, you know, drop back into coverage in, in certain situations. I think he's kind of perfect for a jack role in some of these these defenses where they want to get aggressive. Cooper, how about this? He was the only sophomore to make the Max Preps uh, All-American team, set a school record with 197 tackles. I don't even know if that's accurate. I mean, even if it's 150, <laughs> you know, whoa, look out. Ten and a half sacks, 25 tackles for loss. I, I love the tape. He's one of the guys I feel the best about 
in the 2026 cycle right now. I, I think he's the linebacker one for us. Would not be surprised if that position tag eventually shifted over to edge. And then his teammate, Anthony Davis, you know, another, another guy that can run three down capability. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would avoid Grayson on my schedule uh, if I'm a high school in, in, in Georgia over the next few years, because I, I know those guys are going to make it pretty hard for me. Yeah, I thought Davis was the best defender in pass coverage uh, with that linebacker group. And you had guys like Daryl Johnson out there that we talked about earlier as well. So saying a lot about him, certainly a lot of time for him uh, to kind of move his way up the board, not only for us at 24-7, but with a lot of colleges as well. So there you have it, top five on offense, top five on defense. Thanks to our friend Hudson Stanish did an incredible job on that. Drew, we also have some other noteworthy performances from around the camp. Uh, we would be behooved not to talk about the quarterback performances as well. We've talked about uh, guys like Julian Lewis, but you see the list there. Uh, a lot of talent. Antoine Hill, another guy in the top 100. Deuce Knight. I think one of the most athletic profiles, if not the most athletic profile of any quarterback in the country committed to the Irish. K.J. Lacey was there, uh, a guy that's gotten a lot of comparisons just from a play style size standpoint to Bryce Young. Mason Mims committed to Louisville out of the state of Alabama. And then Landon Duckworth as well, uh, 2026, committed to South Carolina. So, Drew, I'll, I'll start and tee you up with Antoine Hill. I want to get your impressions of him. I mean, 6'5", over 200 pounds. He's about as pretty as pretty can be at the quarterback position. I think you and I are still trying to figure out how high is his ceiling, what's his feel, especially playing in the middle of the field, and what's this guy really going to look like when it's all said and done? I mean, it's it's a frame that you you stop and you do a double take, right? And these guys saw it battle Miami. Uh, we saw him at the Future 50. And remember, he was committed to, to Colorado, and I thought it was kind of the perfect fit because I do see – some similarities to Shadur Sanders with with Antoine Hill in terms of the sense of this is a pocket passer. Now he will run if the opportunity presents itself. But over the past three years there at Houston County, he actually has negative rushing yards, which I think is a bit uh, of a head scratcher. Cooper, I think he's better attacking vertically than he is over the middle. I think he struggles at times to layer the football. And this isn't just one exposure. I mean, this is multiple times I've seen him. Now, that's, that's where he needs to improve, that middle of the field, the in-breaking routes. I think he needs to get better in that department, but he can attack vertically and he can push it down there. He had a pair of uh, power four wide receivers he was throwing to this past season at Houston County. I like him. I think he's got a ways to go. Um, and, you know, I'm excited to see kind of what happens with his recruitment. You know, he was wearing the Georgia Tech towel. Uh, I, I, I brought that up. You said, oh, what about Brent Key? You know, can he be kind of a, a Haynes King out there? So I liked him. What, what about you? I mean, what's, what's your take on Antoine Hill? I think that immediately I think about Antoine Hill, I think about DJ Lagway and not so much as comparable players, but comparable in terms of their timeline a little bit. I think it was so easy to look at DJ Lagway, look at the physical makeup and have high expectations for what this player should be in high school. And then you consider all the different variables, and then you've seen the up arrow and ascending prospect like Lagway. You know, I mention it all the time. I think the biggest thing about Lagway that really kind of caught our eye is that he improved in every major statistical category. And yes, you could poke holes in, in maybe some of the lower body mechanics. He was an upper body thrower. There are some things to nitpick. I think the case is pretty similar when it comes to, to Antoine Hill uh, as well. I think in-person evaluation has left a little bit to be desired, right? He, he is, he, you mentioned it, 6'5", 200-pound frame, he's strong. I think he can make every throw on the field. It's the nuance of the position a little bit. And what I mean by that is timing, accuracy, anticipation. Those happen to be three really important tangibles when evaluating the quarterback position that he's going to need a little bit of polish on. You mentioned the the not the short, but the intermediate throws over the middle that he kind of struggled with a little bit. I think the biggest thing with him, Drew, is is lessons learned uh, as much as maybe there's some, I don't want to say hesitation, but things that we want to see develop in terms of physical traits. You have to be careful with these guys not to overreact. And the biggest thing, especially with the quarterback position, is what do they look like when the lights are the brightest, right? And this is a guy that completed over 70% of his passes, even with us saying that, hey, he's got a lot of room to grow. I kind of I, I view that as a positive, right? Uh, what can he be with coaching? So I like Antoine Hill. I think we have him at number sixty six. I kind of love that spot because I, you know, like if he put it all together, he's he's got the size, he's got the physicality, 
He could be a top 32 type of talent. Now, if, if it doesn't, I kind of like the neighborhood that we have him, right? So I guess all that I'm saying is ceilings and floors game. Uh, I think the best is, hey, this could be a day one guy, obviously with all those tools. And if not, somebody's going to take a chance on him around this range or where we have him at number 66. So I think status quo, the thing about Antoine Hill, the last thing I'll say is I'm always the most impressed coming away from the game tape. And I think that's a really, really good thing when it comes to quarterbacks. So I know that was kind of a loaded answer, but I think he's he's a little bit of um, – He's our case study this year, right? I think we're really excited to see what he can be. And I think a lot of that is going to have to do with the environment and ultimately who he signs with at the end of the day as well. Well, I think we're not the only ones that are, are trying to figure it out, right? Just in terms of where the recruitment's at. You know, a lot of schools have been involved, had to hit reset after Colorado. I don't think we're the only ones in that category. And Cooper, I wasn't saying like, I'm selling stock in Antoine Hill. You know, I'm probably holding stock, much like we did with DJ Lagway coming out of the Elite 11 finals. I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't think I have the answer right now. Um, there are things I like, and I think you you got to hit the nail on the head. The game tape is what you get the most excited about with Antoine Hill. All right. Speaking of enigmas, should we talk about Notre Dame's quarterback commit in Deuce Knight, uh, a guy that started his junior season at Lipscomb Academy, transferred back to the state of Mississippi. Drew, we got him at 140, um, which would be in the fourth round, the back of the fourth round, as it projects to the NFL draft, the eighth quarterback overall. I mean, he's, he's a difficult guy to figure out because the athletic clay is different than everybody else. Uh, and what I mean that is, you know, you're looking at guys six, four and a half over 200 pounds plus. Uh, he has uh, ran, I believe, in the low four fives. He's also a guy that's jumped over 40 inches in the vertical. He can stroke it smooth uh, motion in terms of being a left-handed quarterback, dynamic enough as a runner that you have to respect as well. Drew, peaks and valleys game right when it comes to deuce Knight, i think the lack of continuity in terms of where he's been throughout high school transferring already um and then transferring back uh to to the state of mississippi i think this is a guy that is a true developmental prospect kind of fits what you're looking for in a fourth round guy and if there was a definition of a boomer bust guy it would be deuce Knight, and i don't say that as a negative the other thing i i love this for notre dame I, I really do. I mean, you look at their quarterback situation, what they have. Obviously, you got Riley Leonard, you got Stephen Jelly, uh, you go down the list, you got uh, Kenny Minchie, CJ Carr. They have really smart, cerebral, high floor players uh, in that quarterback room. Then you throw in a guy like Deuce Knight for a guy like Gino Gadouli uh, and Mike Denbrock. It gives you something a little bit different. This guy is not going to step into a situation in South Bend where they are going to expect an immediate ROI. And Deuce Knight, in terms of him being a lottery ticket, Drew, could have a big payout. But on the opposite side, if it doesn't work out, Notre Dame's recruited that room so well in a way that I think they're going to be okay either way. So I, it, this is uh, the definition of a calculated shot for the Irish. But quite honestly, I love it for Marcus Freeman. Yeah, and I wrote Deuce Knight up last night, kind of coming out of the uh, – out of the camp on Sunday, right? And dug into the game tape of him against IMG Academy, where he opened up his season there when he was at Lipscomb Academy, got back into some of the stuff he did in Mississippi. He's an interesting one, Cooper. And peaks and valleys, boom and boom or bust. I think that is, that is everything is there. I think he is very high ceiling, and I think it's it's pretty low floor. Uh, but man, if he hits, it's it's going to be something big. And you know, I was trying to think of a player comp. These are the names I, I wrote down, and you can you can laugh all you want. Uh, I wrote down Terrell Pryor. I, I think there's some similarities, just kind of in terms of their builds. Uh, Kelly Bryant, but like the Kelly Bryant at Clemson in 2017 before he got beat out by uh, T. Law. Uh, bigger Malik Cunningham. And then I think the floor was like Torrance Gibson. Remember him? He was Ohio State. You know, I, I, he's just like kind of in that category because he's an elite, elite athlete. I mean, he is not run first, but he is a true dual threat talent. And you said it, Cooper. I mean, he four six forty. Um, it has a forty inch vertical jump. His broad jump on Sunday was the third longest. Agree, smooth stroke, Coop. And some of his best shots are ones that leave you. Kind of like, whoa, in awe. I mean, he can put it on a rope, and it's effortless with that 
Uh, I thought Sunday he, he really struggled with the accuracy, but you take a step back and you're like, is Deuce Knight supposed to do good in this setting? The answer is probably no. Um, not going to hold, you know, that against him. Uh, it's just going to be one that's going to be interesting to find out. And, you know, other people have seen him on our scouting team. I think it's kind of the same reaction. It's like, okay, like could be something not there right now. And you look at the statistical picture. I mean, he's seven and 13 over the past two years. Um, now he's ran for close to a thousand yards and, and you listed off the measurable. So I like it for Notre Dame. Um, and you think about Mike Denbrock, right? Jaden Daniels, him running the football, you know, now he's going to be at Notre Dame there in South Bend. I, I think Deuce Knight can have that similar type of impact with his legs. Type of player that I think either makes you look really smart as an evaluator or really dumb, right? Like if I could explain it very simply, I think that is Deuce Knight. So we'll see what happens with him. Nonetheless, I love the fact that Notre Dame's taking him. I think that says a lot, says a lot about their, yeah. their current state of their quarterback room as well. Drew, as we go down the list, I mean, this uh, for us, this was a really good exposure point to a lot of really talented quarterbacks. I'll tell you up here, your, your thoughts on K.J. Lacey, who has been a very widely discussed prospect at this position. I thought he was the best of the bunch early on. Um, and then with Julian Lewis, it kind of pulled forward. And what's you know unique about those two is those guys, are it's kind of the same thing, right? It's, it's the size. And K.J. Lacey... I mean, he is a shade over five foot eleven. I think he was around 175 pounds cube. But you noted it. You like the lower half. Like you think there's a chance where he is going to be able to add some weight. You know, how much weight can he add? 195 pounds. I, I don't know. Um, and this is a guy that has played a ton of football there in the state of Alabama. 31 and five on Friday nights, close to 8,000 yards. You know, 90 touchdown passes. Um, I think he can distribute. Um, you know, I think the Bryce Young comp, you can you can certainly see it in some senses. You, you understand why Steve Sarkeesian and the guys there in Austin think that, you know, where do we have him right now? Like day three, uh, I think that is kind of the, the range for him. And then you think about Texas's quarterback room, what they've taken. You know, last cycle, it was Trey Owens who we got in the All-American Bowl, who is the complete opposite of Deuce Knight in terms he is a six foot five, 200 pound guy. So uh, I think I think there's definitely something there. Saw it at Battle Miami as well. And then more importantly, on tape, I mean, he makes a lot of big time throws. Yeah, I think, you know, what I wanted to mention about the frame was that I thought was important when it came to K.J. Lacey. And a, a lot of questions about Bryce Young coming out of high school, coming out of college as well, and how, how his body type has been able to hold up on Sundays. That is always going to be a lingering question when you got a quarterback that's sub six feet. And right now, KJ Lacey coming off this event, 5'11 and a quarter. The thing about the frame that I mentioned is I think he can get to a point where he can withstand it, right? And I think that's really important. I don't know if KJ Lacey is ever going to be a six foot, foot plus guy. Um, but Drew, the more I watch him, he kind of reminds me of a souped up Damon Williams who came out in 2023, had a really good week in San Antonio at the All American Bowl. Signed with Arizona, uh, ends up getting out of his letter of intent, ends up at the University of Washington. The way he fits for Texas, I don't know. I like K.J. Lacey. I'm not sure if he's going to finish playing his collegiate ball at Texas, but I can also see him as a bounce-back guy being in a really good system, whether it was for a guy like – and I'm just saying this. I'm putting this out here, but you think about like Noah Fafiti in Arizona, right? I think that's really important. Um and I know there's some intrigue uh, with Ole Miss in, in a guy like K.J. Lacey. I think that's going to be the most important thing is what structure do you put him in to be the most successful? Now, in terms of how it projects to Sundays, Drew, I don't know. I, I think the other thing, the size is going to get, uh, obviously, that's going to be something that people are going to hit on a lot. Um, I think the other thing as well, he's got an eight-and-a-half-inch hand, too. You bring that into consideration. We all know how the, the scouts at the NFL Combine, right, they're, they're drooling about that as well, probably a little bit too much. But those are things, when people bring that up, people are going to say, look at the production, look at what he's done. I get it. I understand that. We see that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we got to judge it in terms of, all right, how's this guy going to be evaluated on Sundays? I'll add this on KJ Lacey. I agree with everything you just said, especially, right? NFL scouting combine. Look at the quarterbacks that were invited. Look at the quarterbacks that were not invited. It is a measurable scheme for a large part with the quarterbacks. Bryce Young will continue to be the uh, comp for him. He's the exception, right? There is not a lot of exceptions 
uh, right now that are that are making it to to Sundays. Uh, with KJ Lacey, Coop, I don't know if you noticed it. I noticed it at Battle Miami. I saw a little bit of it here. He's got some like moxie to him. People, like players like being around KJ Lacey. You know, I, he's got a fun energy. I, I see kind of like a future team leader there uh, a little bit. I think that does count, especially at a position where you're touching touching the ball every snap. He's a gamer, you know. I, I think that comes with that play style a little bit. You're more of – what do we hear about Bryce Young all the time? He's a point guard, right? And what does that really mean? I mean, yeah, he, he's a distributor, but the ability to improvise, play, make outside of the pocket as well, I think that kind of comes with the territory. And I think a lot of times that kind of matches the mentality uh, and temperament of these guys as well. So a lot of love for K.J. Lacey. We'll see what happens there. Not taking anything away from him. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, I think he's going to be a really, really good football player um, – at the next level on Saturdays. And then in terms of what it looks like Sundays, we got a long way to go. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Drew, finishing out the quarterback conversation, Mason Mims uh, from Alabama committed to Louisville, and then Landon Duckworth, the young signal caller, committed to South Carolina. Any takeaways on those two guys? I think South Carolina's got a good one in Duckworth. Second time seeing him this offseason, dug into his sophomore tape. This is a two-year starter, Cooper, state qualifier in the high jump. Uh, can throw it down on the hardwood. I'm a fan of Landon Duckworth. I've seen a lot of 2026 quarterbacks. Everyone thinks, you know, this is the next one. I'm not, I'm not saying he's like a five-star prospect, but uh, I get fired up, especially knowing what they took in Dante Reno after Lenora Sellers. I think Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks got ahead of the curve with Landon Duckworth. Excited to see him and track him over the next two years. So South Carolina fans, be excited about what you got committed in that 2026 class. We've gone a little sicko mode on this recap. I think we've gone over 50 minutes, but we still have a little bit more <laughs> left. Drew, a couple of names, and uh, we'll do some one-liners here. Top 247 edge, Isaiah Gibson was there, top 100 player for us. Also, Ethan Barber, the Georgia commit, also in the top 247. Travis Smith Jr. Uh, also got a lot of recognition on Sunday, and then Mario Nash Jr. as well. So, Drew, you can fly through that, take that whatever way you want to go but what'd you like about those guys well I think Isaiah Gibson me and you have been talking about him all week kind of what we thought he is uh tons of growth potential you know one-on-ones I, I think he was a, kind of a fish out of the water but you put on the tape he is playing a wide nine uh there at Warner Robins High School easy to see why everyone including George is all over him he was wearing the Georgia jacket uh, I think the Bulldogs are going to be hard to beat uh Ethan Barber sticking with the theme of, of UGA you know another tight end going there what stood out to me, Coop, short area quickness, how he was getting separation at the top of the route. Not the biggest guy. Um, I've compared him in the past to Orison Charles, um, Trey McKitty, guys that uh, Todd Hartley has had. I, I liked him. Travis Smith, big framed wide receiver. Uh, he was dominant in one-on-ones. Huge calves. I mean, he is a guy that can box you out. And then finally, Mario Nash. Offensive line MVP, could have made a case that he should have been a, a top performer for us. Uh, a guy that a lot of schools are in on there in the state of Mississippi. I'm, I'm buying some stock in, in Mario Nash. More IOL than he is tackle. I think there's something there. Like Penn State is is after Mario Nash, which, which was kind of surprising to me. All right, James Franklin. You know, when's the last time they've tried to go down in Mississippi and win a guy? It's a tough place to recruit, but there you have it, the recap for the 2024 Under Armour Atlantic Combine. And I'll tell you what, if you're one of those sickos out there that made it through all 50 minutes of that <laughs> recap, congratulations, you're officially a recruiting nerd. No better place for recruiting nerds on Tuesday and Wednesday than on the 24-7 Sports Football Recruiting Podcast. But what about Monday? you got the college football recruiting show, the best in the business. Emily Proud and Blair Angulo breaking it down every Monday, 5 o'clock Eastern time. Guys, we appreciate you sticking with us, but we are not done yet. Make sure to like and subscribe. Drew, you and I were kind of talking about this over the weekend. I think it's going to be pretty funny uh, when the same people that complain about rankings now get to start complaining about, hey, my guy's not rated where he's supposed to be on the new NCAA EA Sports college football game 2025. That comes out in May. So I guess that's going to take a little pressure off of us. But it got me to thinking, all right, who is going to be in that exclusive 99 overall club? And Drew, we all know how hard that is uh, to be in that exclusive club, one of one. There's not many given out. If we've seen anything from Madden, what, it's been 10-plus years since the NCAA game uh, has been out? Now we got 2025 coming out here in a couple months. I love this conversation. Drew, 
candidates for the 99 overall, maybe the number one rated overall player, whatever way you want to do it. I'll start. I just think this game is made for Colorado and Deion Sanders in primetime, right? And what other way to do it than to have the best marketing tool out there, Travis Hunter, the number one player in 2022. People didn't know whether he was going to be a corner. People didn't know whether he was going to be a receiver. Till this day, people don't know whether he's a receiver or a corner. It doesn't really matter. He's one of the best players in all of college football, Drew. I think this guy has so much brand recognition. He can be the face of college football, and he is one of the few faces of college football and where it is in the transfer portal NIL. He literally checks all those boxes, Drew. 57 receptions, 721 yards, five touchdowns. Also had three INTs on defense last year, preseason All-American. He also did that uh, with a lacerated liver. So you take that into consideration. I think he's got to be one of those guys given consideration. The other one, Drew, how about Caleb Downs, the number one player in the transfer portal, top 10 player in 2023, number one safety. We talk about clean players all the time, and what does that mean? That is Caleb Downs. That is literally – Caleb Downs, if there was a 99 overall ranking and I was on the EA Sports Rankings Council or whatever, and they said, all right, who is the best player in college football? I think you'd have a pretty hard time not going with either Travis Hunter or Caleb Downs. Hey, if EA reached out to you and said, we need you to grade all these guys, would you do it? Hell yeah, I would, would do you? it. <laughs> I would love that. Only if you could be like they do for the Madden, where you get to go to the games and stand on the sidelines, like in scout, you know, with the. I'm not doing it for adjust. free, you know. I want I want some nil money with it, but yeah, I'll do it. All right, who, okay, do, well, who do you got? Well, you took the two easy ones, um, so I, I, I'm going, you know, going rogue here or in the weeds, whatever you want to say, off roading. Luther Burden. Missouri wide receiver. Um, I think this guy is a dude. Uh, according to PFF, only person to rank in the top 10 of all three of these stats this past season. Yards after catch, missed tackles, uh, and contested catches. 86 receptions, 1,200 yards, nine touchdowns. Former number two wide receiver for us in the class of 2022. I think Luther Burden, all his NIL deals. What does he got? Like a barbecue sauce, barbecue chips. I'm all in. I think he could be a 99 overall. And then how about this one, Cooper? James Pierce, the edge rusher at Tennessee, came on strong to end the 2023 season. Fifth best defensive player per PFF with a 91 overall grade in 2023. Uh, third best pass rushing grade behind Lau Latu and Ben Ball, 10 sacks, 14 and a half tackles for loss, 16 quarterback hurries. I think he's a candidate for that 99 club. I mean, I don't know about you. When I play the game, I'm always choosing an edge rusher to crash around the edge. I'd love to see James Pierce with that little star underneath him. I think that would be pretty fun. And then think you're playing with Tennessee on the other side of the ball. You got Nico throwing around some passes. It could be, uh, it could be fun. You know who I think is going to be really fun to play with? Kansas State, Avery Johnson. Kind of, it brings me back to the days Al Roberson and Darren Sproles. They were one of my favorite teams to play with. Drew, the other thing um, off roading here a little bit that I was thinking about do you think EA Sports is thinking about, like technology is so different than what it was 10 years ago, right? You think about, all right, like the, the incoming freshman class. I'm thinking about like Jelani Watkins, who is one of, or, or Nicholas Harbor, right? For, for example, the speed data like overall or a guy like Zachariah Branch like sure yeah you, you got your no-brainers at the top of the board but I wonder if EA Sports is going to be like filtering through athletic.net or mile split to be <laughs> like hey well, what are these guys in terms of like verified speed what are we looking at well that, that I also had Malachi Starks written down here I was talking about Brad Cawford he was doing a story I was like hey you know Malachi Starks went like 10-5 in the 100-meter dash. And he's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, number one freak in the 2022 cycle. And he's like, no, no wonder you can get hash to hash with ease. Uh, no, yeah, Coop, that's, that's going to be interesting because especially all the kids complaining on X or, or Twitter, whatever you want to call it, they can they got receipts with those uh, verified 10-8s and, and 10-6s and all that stuff, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Somebody said in our group text the other day, I got to give them a lot of credit. It's going to be the season of like, all right, bet, right? When the ra ratings come out, that's, that's going to be the, the logical response to everybody who's pretty disappointed in, in what's coming back. Are you getting the game or what? I already told my wife, like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, yes, I want to. Um, that being said, I'm not a big gamer, right? I mean, I was when I was a kid, but I don't, 
like uh, how much are those it's not so much the game as much as what am i going to play it on i don't have anything you know i had like xbox 360 or like it's been a long time man i'm, I'm pretty rusty so we'll see what happens i i have no console either so uh <laughs> budgeting for summer to purchase no, something no doubt we'll figure it out guys we appreciate you as always being with us today for andrew ivans i'm cooper patagna like i said make sure to like and subscribe we'll be back same time tomorrow with our buddy tom loy five o'clock eastern time see you then